Welcome to this webinar on was it wise to sign the treaty, a discussion of the implications for the Irish Republic, the North and Ireland's relations with the wider world. I'm very delighted to be welcome everyone this evening. Uh, 160 people have signed up, so there's enormous interest in this topic, and rightly so. And very much looking forward to Mary Harris's talk. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute at NUI Galway. And we are delighted to be hosting on behalf of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society and the School of History and Philosophy at NUI Galway. And I'm going to hand over now to Dr. John Cunningham. John, over to you. Hello. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dan. Uh, so on behalf of the um, Galway Archaeological and Historical Society, I'd like to thank the Moore Institute, um, uh, Dan, who we've just seen, and also Matthew uh, uh, Garrity for once again collaborating with us in bringing a lecture before the public. And um, as Dan says, I'm uh, John Cunningham. I'll be chairing tonight's lecture, uh, deputising uh, for the Society's president, uh, uh, Dr. Shane O'Diver. Tonight we have a topical subject, was it wise to sign the treaty? And we have a distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Mary Harris, who I'll introduce properly in a few minutes. Uh, this is one of a series of uh, lectures. And um, since our last lecture, there's been um, a development, which I'll draw uh, to your attention, a development in the society's uh, business. Uh, that's the uh, publication of the society's annual journal. And I'd like to congratulate first the editor, uh, Jackie Ihiana, Dr. Jackie Ihiana, who's the editor of, um, the, of, of, of uh, the journal uh, for the past uh, number of years. Now, the Society has been publishing articles on the history and archaeology of Galway County and City since 1900, and Jackie has just completed work on volume uh, 73, which was sent out to members uh, just before Christmas, uh, with new research on topics like the kelp industry and iodine works in Galway, the Anadown drowning tragedy, uh, Gaelic legal professionals in the 16th century, national history, natural history perspectives on Connemara in the 19th century, the Battle of Athenry in 1316, boot scrapers in the urban streetscape, and we have two articles uh, dealing with Mayo matters, the Ackle missions, and uh, Croke Patrick. So if you want uh, to um, become a member of the society, get the journal and be informed of events, um, you can uh, get in touch. I'll be putting an email address in uh, the uh, chat um, uh, in, 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 in a few moments. Uh, just to flag uh, forthcoming events, um, the, um, uh, uh, we have our February lecture uh, deals with the arms crisis of 1970. Uh, the lecturer is Michael Heaney, um, as well regarding whether it'll be online or face to face. We're not absolutely uh, certain yet, but we'll be keeping people uh, updated. By Liacht Mi Morta in Oilge, Agus Isaian Kararua, Agus Kanter, Nanilon, as a Neoish Jig and Talver, as she and Doctor. Now, uh, to uh, move on, uh, you will have questions, uh, presumably to ask the lecturer, or some of you will uh, certainly. Um, so um, as these questions strike you, um, you might enter them into the Q&A um, uh, 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 section uh, there in front of you, rather than into the chat. Um, I'll be putting the questions uh, to the lecturer at the end, uh, but you may uh, pose your questions um, at, any, uh, at, at any time. So um, that uh, is the business out of the way. Uh, so it's my pleasure now uh, to introduce our lecturer, uh, Dr. Mary Harris, um, is a colleague in the history uh, department at NUI Galway. Uh, she's a Cork woman, who attended UCC and the University of Cambridge before uh, joining us at NUI Galway in 1996. Uh, uh, um, her research and her teaching has focused on um, 
church-state relations um, and political ideologies in Ireland and on the conflict in Northern Ireland. And she's a member of the state's expert advisory group on centenary um, commemorations. Uh, so uh, the question then, uh, Mary, we have to ask you is, uh, was it wise uh, to sign the treaty? Okay, hey, thank you very much, John. Well, the role of negotiating the Anglo-Irish Treaty was undoubtedly a poison chalice. Public expectations far exceeded anything likely to be achieved. It was all the more onerous given the sense of obligation to the earlier generations and iconic revolutionary documents referred frequently to previous efforts of resistance, none of which had involved the level of mobilization evident in the revolutionary decade. Yet the obstacles facing the negotiators were massive. Um, in the form of the British government's determination to maintain Ireland within the empire and Ulster Union's determination to consolidate their own separate statelet. So this paper seeks to look at some of the perceptions of the Republican goal, the attempts to achieve it, um, and consideration of alternatives, particularly in re with reference to the crown and the question of unity. Um, sorry. Uh, the years preceding the War of Independence were years of intense political and cultural activism, uh, and there were a period of a strong sense of possibility. Organisations like the Gaelic League, Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers sought to attract a wide audience and to instill a sense of national self-confidence. Activists sought to be inclusive insofar as possible and to promote a sense of a cohesive nation. Now, at times, this is somewhat unrealistic. If we take, for example, the case of the Irish volunteers, whose stated aim was to secure and maintain the rights and liberties of all the people of Ireland, but uh, undoubtedly not all the rights people laid claim to were compatible. And so there was an element of unrealism about some of this. There was also an element of constructive ambiguity about the volunteers, as noted by the historian Peter Brown. Uh, leading figures had different objectives, some overt, some covert, uh, covert. And a recurring slogan in the rhetoric of the Irish volunteers, very much promoted by Owen McNeill, was they have rights who dare maintain them. This was borrowed from an American poet, Robert Lowell. But it's important to think of this as being one of the guiding um, slogans of the time that really put much emphasis on assertion. Pierce, in his essay, The Coming Revolution, published in 1913, predicted a plethora of organizations. I quote, many of them seemingly contradictory, some mutually destructive, yet all tending towards a common objective, and that objective of the Irish Revolution. Indeed, many of these organizations were internally divided, but nevertheless, the, the rising provided a dramatic focus, and some figures who actually hadn't favored a rising People like Michael O'Reilly, for example, who was part of the effort to call the rising off, Hannah Shee Skeffington, who was a pacifist, and Louise Gavin Duffy, a, a very significant Irish language figure. These were people who um, hadn't approved of the prospect of a rising, but nevertheless offered their services when they discovered it was underway. So there was a sense of galvanizing um, various um, people at this point. Um, and the British government's response then had to create further unity. A treaty, however, was a different matter. This requires much more specificity and difference of opinion are much more difficult to deal with in this context. So let's turn now to the, the main aim of the rebels, which was to achieve a republic. And Theobald Wolftone, seen as the father of Irish republicanism, was remarkably light on political theory, as various historians have commented. Um, however, his emphasis on the breaking of breaking the connection with England and uniting Catholic, Protestant and dissenter uh, was very frequently recalled. A number of recent studies have sought to look at Irish republicanism in a wider context. They have noted, I'm thinking now particularly of um, Gavin Foster, for example, um, and Sean Donnelly, who've talked about the lack of theorizing on Irish republicanism. Um, but Gavin Foster in, uh, in his study, um, talks about the view of Philip Pettit, Quentin Skinner, and J.G.A. Pocock, that republicanism involves, I quote, complete freedom from the arbitrary will of another, whether that is exercised or not. Liberty involves the absence of structures of domination. Philip Pettit, who spoke here at our um, conference in 2016, um, on the question of republicanism is one of the key figures um, in 
um, expounding on various um, versions of republicanism, but he talks about the absence of liberty being a grievance, even in the case of, for example, a benevolent slave master. So this is important because we will find in the era leading up to the War of Independence many references to slavery, serfdom and degradation. And these terms refer generally to the lack of self um, government in Ireland, the lack of autonomy, essentially. The 1916 proclamation was very specific on this. It declared the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and infeasible. And this was ratified uh, or the proclamation was considered ratified by the Declaration of Independence in 1919 at the opening of the first oil where the statement was, we ordain that the elected representatives of the Irish people alone have power to make laws binding on the Irish, on Ireland, and that the Irish Parliament is the only Parliament to which that people give its allegiance. After that document was read out in the Doyle, the TDs were asked to stand and repeat after the Ceann Corla a statement ratifying the declaration and pledging themselves to do their utmost to implement it at every, by every means at their disposal. Now, a few months later, TDs, clerks of the Doyle and members of the Irish Volunteers were required to swear the following oath. And you can see here, there's really no scope for um, evasion or ambiguity. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I do not or shall not yield a voluntary support to any pretended government, authority or power within Ireland, hostile and inimical thereto. And I do furthermore swear or affirm that to the best of my knowledge and ability, I will give support and defend the Irish Republic and the government of the Irish Republic, which is the oil iron against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear to faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. Now, some of you might find this vaguely familiar, not only from your studies of Irish history, but in fact, it seems to be very closely modeled on the American oath of office, an oath uh, uh, which uh, in its current format um, emerged or very something very similar to it during the American War of uh, the American Civil War. So it's interesting again that um, there is a reference here to enemies, foreign and domestic, and this is to be quite relevant going forward. So the question then was um, how the uh, progress, how the objective of the Republic could be progressed after a truce came into effect on the 11th of July 1921. So De Valera and Lloyd George met four times in the summer of 1921. Responding um, to the initial invitation, De Valera said, we most earnestly desire to help in bringing about a lasting peace between the peoples of these two islands, but see no avenue by which it can be reached if you deny Ireland's essential unity and set aside the principle of self, national self-determination. So here again, we have the two key elements in negotiating the treaty. One was the question of national unity and the other national self-determination and the, what was envisaged very much was the Republic. De Valera, um, despite whatever reservations he might have had about negotiating, he was well aware that um, it would be easier, it would be preferable to negotiate with Lloyd George than with his successors. Because Lloyd George at this point headed a very fragile coalition government. And the plenary potentiaries also later were well aware that um, if Lloyd George fell, and at various points indeed during the later negotiation, he talked about resigning. And in that case, the alternative or whoever would succeed him and the person they had in mind later was Andrew Bonner Law, who had famously in 1912 stated that he could imagine no length of resistance to which Ulster could go in, in which he would not be prepared to support them. So we have here and um, the prospect of a diehard unionist coming to power uh, if Lloyd George had to resign. So this was one of the considerations to be borne in mind, even though the starting point um, was somewhat questionable in terms of their likely chances of success. Now, documents produced during the summer of 1921 indicate some creative thinking on the part of the Irish. Um, for example, Robert Brennan wrote to Gavin jo George Gavin Duffy at one point talking about the possibility of autonomy for Ulster within the Irish state. And this is a document of the 1st of July before um, De Valera got to, uh, to London at all. At that point, um, Craig uh, was very much opposed to anything, James Craig as Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, he was opposed to anything other than what he had achieved 
with the northern state and he certainly wasn't going to be drawn into um, the possibility of uh, autonomy for the six counties within an Irish framework. The link with the Crown was absolutely crucial to him. Lloyd George sent proposals for dominion status to de Valera on the 20th of July, and these included recognition of the powers and privileges of the Northern Ireland Parliament. And Lloyd George hoped the reunification would come about through consent in due course, as it happened uh, in Canada. In September, Lloyd George, I mean, this, at this point, uh, the negotiations had happened a few times, but Lloyd George proposed and de Valera agreed on negotiations ascertaining um, or to ascertain how the association of Ireland with the community of nations known as the British Empire may best be reconciled with Irish aspirations and de Valera was prepared to engage with this. So we find at this point de Valera has had four meetings with Lloyd George but has actually not made that, um, that much success, uh, not much progress. So just want to move to another slide here. Um, sorry, this used to be stuck. Right. So De Valera um, was not prepared to go and negotiate himself. And this has been the subject of much um, debate over the years and many recriminations within his own lifetime also. And Patrick Murray in an interesting article entitled uh, Obsessive Historian, Eamon de Valera and the Policing of His Reputation has noted many attempts by de Valera subsequently to justify his position, that is his position, his decision not to go. So Murray then lists uh, what these excuses were. He told, for example, one person, uh, Joseph McGarity, that he wanted to avoid compromising the Republic. He wanted to be in reserve so that the delegates would not be rushed into hasty decisions. Uh, he also mentioned that he wanted to influence extreme Republicans to consent to external association if the British accepted it. He told somebody else that he didn't want to repeat Wilson's mistake in going to Paris and London in 1919. He felt that Wilson had been unnecessarily um, drawn into conflict. Uh, Frank Gallagher, a close ally of de Valera, is believed that just as the monarch did not attend, then the president of Ireland should not be expected to attend either. Now, another reason I would suggest myself, however, is that de Valera had not been a very successful negotiator over the summer. He had met James Craig at one point as Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, and he embarked on a lengthy historical account, um, much to Craig's boredom, apart from anything else. Uh, another uh, person, the Dominion Secretary, for example, had a similar uh, encounter with him where de Valera started with this moral historical tale. Lloyd George found him in, infuriating also. So he tended very much to start off his uh, engagement with some people with lengthy historical discourses showing essentially the injustices to Ireland in the past. Lloyd George found him quite infuriating. He described his discussions with de Valera as being like trying to pick up mercury with a fork or like sitting on a merry-go-round horse, going round and round, but never getting any closer to the man on the horse in front. Perhaps then de Valera recognised his own limitations in deciding not to go to London. Um, Arthur Griffith did go, though de Valera said to him, there may have to be scapegoats. Now, this was actually something that was recalled in the Doyle later. Arthur Griffith himself brought up this reference to scapegoats um, at the point when he was going to go and Griffith was prepared to be the scapegoat. Um, Kathleen Clark, uh, a close ally of de Valera, has also mentioned this later. Um, other people who might have been expected to go included Cahill Brewer, Minister for Defence, but he uh, refused to be involved in the negotiating team, as did Austin Stack, who had accompanied him to London that summer. Michael Collins didn't want to go either, but he was somehow persuaded to. So the other two figures who went then as part of the negotiating team were Robert Barton, who was Minister for Economic Affairs, and Eamon Duggan, who again had been with de Valera in London. And Duggan's role was very much one of liaising um, with British officials. And both Duggan and Barton had been involved in arranging the truce. Now, we have various accounts then from historians, including Ronan Fanning, for example, David McCullough, 
um, Charles Townsend of the negotiations over the summer, which went on at great length. They took different formats, some involving one-to-one uh, -one conversations. Um, for much of the time, the, the latter negotiations, the, the key figures really on the Irish side were Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. And as time progressed, it was becoming increasingly difficult to find um, an answer. And all of this perhaps um, should be viewed against what exactly their credentials were when they were um, delegated to go. And we find here it's often been pointed out that the plenipotentiary's powers, and they were called plenipotentiary's powers, seem to be somewhat contradictory. And that um, there's a uh, first reference to them having full powers. Then there's an understanding that before decisions are reached, a dispatch notifying the intention to make the decisions must reach Dublin and the reply must be awaited. And then the there's an understanding that the complete text um, would need to be submitted to Dublin um, in advance. So these certainly, even though people have complained about these being contradictory uh, by way of an excuse, there is no doubt that the points two here and three are categorical and these were not adhered to in the end. So during the negotiations, one of the issues that arose occasionally was the possibility that Lloyd George would resign. He raised this himself. Um, and there, were, there was quite a lot of um, travel involved in the jobs. We have accounts of the toing and froing across the Irish Sea, um, which became quite onerous. And indeed, there was a level of suspicion at the other side as well. For example, when the delegates were initially being appointed and Countess Markovic um, was expressing some anxiety. She said that she had been elected because she once fought for the Republic and the electors believed she would do it again. And she realized the seriousness of what was um, at, um, at hand here. And Mary McSweeney talked about, uh, she spoke out strongly about the possibility of compromise. And indeed, Margaret Pierce, um, the mother of Patrick Pierce, recalled the and the reference at O'Donovan Ross's graveside to Ireland being unconquered and unconquerable. So back home, there's this sense of anxiety and hope on the part of um, certain members of the Doyle, a lot of them probably that no compromise would be made. But on the other hand, it was becoming increasingly difficult um, to actually reach agreement. And at the weekend of the 23rd of October, Collins returned to Dublin and said the delegates wanted de Valera to join, but he was not going to do so. And shortly after that, the situation became more complicated. Griffith was prepared to recommend some form of association with the Crown, contingent on essential Irish unity being assured. So in a sense, he was prepared to give up on one. And we find throughout all of this as well, a, a, dis a clear, a interesting distinction on the perceptions of how things might go in the case of a breakdown. And the Irish team from the outset had thought that if they had to break off negotiations, they should do it on the Ulster question. Um, uh, whereas the British government wanted an, any break to be on the issue of the Crown because they thought that it would look more plausible to outsiders than breaking on Ulster. So these tensions were there um, and certainly Griffith was coming round to the idea of some kind of compromise. So uh, one, he did recommend then um, the possibility of some form of association contingent on essential unity, but met with a strong response from de Valera saying, we are all here, that is back in Dublin. Uh, we are at one that there can be no question of asking our Irish people to enter an arrangement which would make them subject to the crown or demand from them allegiance to the British King. If war is the alternative, we can only face it. Now, ultimately we find um, de Valera um, increasingly being absolutely rigid in his decision not to go to London at this point and the um, treaty negotiators coming under extreme pressure and the Saturday before the treaty was actually signed they were back in Dublin um, having had not very much sleep having spent a lot of time traveling and when they returned Michael Collins at one point didn't want to go into the next meeting um, but ultimately um, the negotiators came under extreme pressure from Lloyd George who had told him he had set a deadline um, by which he was going to send a message to James Craig telling him what had been decided. He, now, this might be, seem a bit odd in one sense in that um, James Craig, we could say, is 
hadn't been very cooperative when Lloyd George tried to draw him into negotiations with the Irish, but suddenly um, this becomes a crucial matter, the fact that uh, Craig is awaiting a response back in, in Belfast and that a train is about to go with that message. Um, in fact, it's not clear why, or it's not actually very plausible that it was absolutely essential to do it at that particular point. But it was done, and the ultimate agreement then involved some major concessions. So we want to consider now what the reaction was to the treaty. Now, the treaty once the treaty was signed in the early hours of um, the sixth of December, um, apparently around two fifteen a.m., um, there was considerable grief on the part of uh, Collins himself, realizing the trouble that was going to arise from it. Uh, Eamon Duggan headed off immediately or very shortly after that to, to Dublin with the treaty and there was a decision not to um, release it to the press in Ireland or Britain until eight o'clock that evening. There are various accounts of how de Valera spent that day. He knew that the treaty had been signed Then this was, of course was contrary to his own instructions um, and he rather strangely was not at the end of the phone while these final negotiations were taking place. He had gone to Clare and then to Limerick and he spent that day, it seems, then waiting um, for what would um, be ultimately a fairly devastating treaty in his eyes. So when the Doyle then met on the 14th of December to discuss it, Arthur Griffiths um, said Attempts have been made to create in the public mind the impression that we went there pledged to the Republic and pledged to bring back nothing but a Republic. I want you to recollect uh, all that happened. I would not have gone. Nobody in his senses would have gone there in such circumstances. If we want the recognition of the Republic, uh, if we wanted the recognition of a Republic as a preliminary, we could have said so. So, um, and Griffiths and Michael Collins over the following few Doyle debates um, sought to emphasize the positives of what they had actually achieved, but there were some serious um, limitations. And it's interesting at that point to see how uh, a number of the speakers in the Doyle referred back to Parnell. And again, I suppose this is an example of the historical speaking people up and to some, in some ways referred back to Parnell because they're aware of the Parnell split that had occurred in 1891 and how horrible it became. But uh, what was more often recalled was Parnell's statement back in 1885, no, ma no man has the right to fix the boundary to the march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shalt thou go and no further. And at this point, the de Valera's comment was greeted with great enthusiasm. However, we, it's interesting to see that in Parnell's um, statement about setting the boundary to the march of a nation is, was taken up by both pro and anti treatyites. Later in the day, um, Collins countered with the argument. He said, in my opinion, it gives us the freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations desire and, uh, and develop to, but the freedom to achieve it. And likewise, Griffith argued, who is to say what the world will be like in 10 years hence? And this is a, a very Kind of relevant comment to make because what was going to happen over the next 10 years was to have crucial uh, implications for the benefits of the treaty in the long run. Griffith said we can make peace with the treaty, it, is, it does not bind us forever not to ask for more. Um, and then there were others who, who felt strongly that the treaty should be grasped. And um, Porrick O'Moyler from County Galway argued that the treaty, if it were defeated, there would be no nation. Now, within the treaty itself, then the elements that were particularly galling to Republicans included the Article 3, which provided for a Crown representative in Ireland, similar to the Governor General of Canada. And there was really very little information, uh, or practically no information as to what this would involve. But um, people uh, jumped to the worst conclusion. And Markovich, for example, predicted a pernicious English materialistic influence. And there were suspicions that this would be more or less um, something like a continuation of Dublin Castle con uh, culture. And ultimately, the expectations of the governor general were a, the expectation, expectations of deep suspicion were unwarranted because the role wasn't all that important. But nevertheless, the fact that um, it was going to be a connection between the crown and Ireland was viewed as being abhorrent. Worse still, of course, was the oath uh, to be taken by members of Parliament. So let's just have a look here. Um, 
I see that the screen has disappeared from me now. So I'm not sure what you can see. Because you can see cabinet instructions to the planet potential. Okay, right. Yeah, you might have to restart the, the actual slideshow rather than the uh I think okay. in the yeah, there we go. Right. There we go. Okay. So this is the oath uh, in the treaty. I just solemnly swear to faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State as by law established, and that I will be faithful to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors uh, by law in virtue of the common citizenship of Ireland with Great Britain and her adherence to and membership of the group of nations forming the British Commonwealth of Nations. So the treaty had actually begun with reference to Ireland being granted dominion status similar to the status of Canada. Um, and we see here that the crown is included here, with the reference to King George V, his heirs and successors by law, but it's in virtue of common citizenship. So that was seen as a power, any reference at all to the monarchy would, was abhorrent to some people. Others would find it not so bad because it was just in view of the common citizenship um, of, with the British Commonwealth of Nations. Um, however, the reaction to it in the Doyle was extremely strong indeed. The swearing of the allegiance um, was bound to raise hackles. Of course, this was a fairly um, permissible. Margaret Pierce, mother of Patrick Pierce, was uh, absolutely appalled. And she said, I'd consider I'd be perjuring myself in breaking the oath I had to Doyle Aaron. An oath is the most sacred vow made in the presence of Almighty God to witness to the truth. So this is a view held by quite a number of people that the oath um, prescribed by the, the Doyle, by the treaty was absolutely incompatible with what had been um, uh, sworn previously. And throughout the Doyle debates, this was going to be a, a very serious issue. However, an even worse element here was not immediately apparent um, and that is the reference to the constitution of the Irish Free State. One would have thought that that would give um, the Irish, the members of the Doyle, the satisfaction that they would be able to draw up their own constitution. However, the situation that emerged later was quite different from that. The treaty and the treaty negotiators really couldn't have envisaged the extent of British influence over the constitution. Collins, um, Michael Collins, who became chairman of the provisional government in uh, January 19. Or, uh, 21, uh, had hoped that a constitution could be drawn up quickly, and he had hoped also it would be a, 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 it would appeal to de Valera supporters. He envisaged a short document that could be easily amended later, and this is one of the features of a, 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 one of the issues for a number of those involved in the drafting process. They didn't want to see themselves restricted in any way later on, or they didn't want their successes to be restricted. Now, in the end, it took longer to draw because the, the team, given the, the task, ultimately came up with three drafts. And this took some time to sift, and the document was submitted to London on the 27th of May. But it was considered unacceptable and major redrafting was required. Now, if that had been envisaged um, at the time when the treaty was being negotiated, I think um, there would probably have been considerably more trouble than there actually was. But this turned out to be extremely problematic. The preamble of the revised version of the treaty specified that the constitution should be construed with reference to the treaty and that any amendment of the constitution or legislation repugnant to the treaty should be considered void. The, the revised version also included reference to the oath and the right of appeal to the British Privy Council Article 17 reproduced the oath to be taken by members of the Arachthus, and the entire treaty was appended as Schedule 2 at the end of the Constitution. So this was a grave um, disappointment. One of the, uh, at this time, De Valera, or Michael Collins and uh, was hoping to maintain the, um, the support and to be able to work with anti-treatyites. Um, and he uh, he had considered, for example, the, the treaty drafters had come up with a plan to allow for certain government ministers um, to come from outside. These are people who wouldn't necessarily um, be in the cabinet, but nonetheless would have some expertise and could have ministerial roles. So that would have been a way of drawing anti-treatyites into some form of coalition. However, 
the British government wouldn't allow that. And they insisted that if there were such ministers, they would have to take the oath. Another interesting development, and this I'm drawing here on the work of um, Thomas More on the British influence on the 1922 constitution. Uh, another element of this was the decision that uh, a lot of the Irish language terms in the constitution should be replaced with English terms. So, for example, the term Uchtaran, meaning president, was not allowed. And the term president wasn't permitted either because that sounded like um, the ruler of a republic. So what the British allowed was president of the Executive Council to describe the position that's essentially that um, of the Prime Minister. So in, in these elements, uh, undoubtedly, the, the British element and the British connection was very much reinforced. And even if Griffith and Collins were optimistic and thought they had done well to get as much as they had, for example, at least the reference to King George V here, and in a particular capacity might have been acceptable to some people. But uh, having redrafted the treaty in this form was another matter entirely. And even though the drafts, the in initial drafts, weren't available to the Republic at the time, the, the people were aware that the treaty was being redrafted in London, and this had a, an impact on public perceptions of the relationship between Ireland and Britain also. So turning now to the Northern question, which had been a crucial figure also a feature, most nationalists abhorred the concept of partition and considered it unnatural. Now, references, examples here of it being unnatural include um, references to the finger, to the, the um, island of Ireland having a frontier drawn by the finger of God. There were references to the biblical quotation you probably associate with marriage, what God has put us uh, drawn together, let no man put us under. And there were uses also of uh, emotive language such as mutilation, amputation and vivisection to refer to partition. And this was the case in the years leading up to the War of Independence and around this time also of the treaty drafting and uh, after partition also. So following unionist arguments against home rule, Ulster unionists had a uh, often represented themselves as being different in character from the rest of the Ireland, in, in particular by being more prosperous, which they attributed partly to the um, Protestant work ethic. And this led to this concept around the time of the Third Home Rule Crisis of what was known as the Two Nation Theory. What well, the Home Rule leader, John Redmond, at the time, described it as an abomination and a blasphemy. Sorry, this is gone again. Uh, So even the Home Rule leader just found it absolutely abhorrent and ultimately when cornered into producing uh, support for, uh, for, home, for partition or allowing it in any capacity at all, he was utterly horrified by this cornering of him. So the, the concept of partition was also very much opposed um, by Owen McNeill in the Irish Volunteer newspaper. And uh, he uh, was appalled, he believed, and he was an Ulster man himself, but he strongly argued that, in fact, there was no need for conflict in Ulster. And when it did occur, it was being um, stirred up by troublemakers. Um, usually he associated the trouble with uh, coming from British politicians or various um, malicious influences. So, for example, in one of his articles in the Irish Volunteer, he said, I am no believer in the doctrine uh, that the disease of Ulsteria is an incurable gangrene demanding amputation. Ulsteria is an artificial complaint, a blood poisoning deliberately contrived with the help of English interference and English money. The, English, the 1916 proclamation was equally dismissive. Um, declaring its intention to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, um, and it was committed to being oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. Now, indeed, um, for those who believed that the Ulster campaign or the, the Unionist campaign was implausible, it must be acknowledged that Carson, as leader of the Ulster Unionists um, earlier in the century, had indeed um, been campaigning for a, a special arrangements for Ulster very much in a for, as a form of bluff. I think it's Alvin Jackson who said that this began as a tactic and then became a compromise. Uh, so initially he hoped the Redmond and the government would back down, but this didn't happen. 
And um, at a certain point, both Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, both advocates of Home Rule, were prepared to consider the exclusion of Ulster. Now, the Home Rule Bill, as we know, was um, passed in 1914, but um, suspended for the duration of the war. But in 1916, just after the rising, Lloyd George appeared in one of his early roles dealing with um, the Irish. He negotiated with Redmond and Carson separately and left them with very different impressions. And this might have raised alarm bells if anyone had been following it closely or, or if anyone remembered it in 1921, because Redmond saw the arrangement as temporary at the time and Carson saw it as permanent. Now, eventually it became obvious from press accounts that they couldn't both be right. And Lloyd George was pressed to clarify matters. And it turned out the partition might indeed be permanent and Redmond withdrew his support. But it was it, it was seen at the time as an example of um, Lloyd George's duplicity. And later on, when a fourth Home Rule Bill, which is the Government of Ireland Bill, um, received royal assent on the 23rd of December 1920, um, at that time, um, public opinion in Ireland was very much inflamed and most nationalists wanted nothing to do with the Government of Ireland Act. This came very soon after the death of Terence McSweeney and hunger strike, Bloody Sunday, the Kilmichael ambush, the burning of Cork. So it seemed to many people as an anachronism. Um, and it, it, nevertheless, the, the new parliament in Belfast opened on the 22nd of June 1921 with great pomp and ceremony and the uh, 10th Hussars were present. I'd, so it's worth just noting here that this was a very elaborate event at the time. It was going to be very difficult to undo. So this seems somewhat incongruous, perhaps, with the attempts by Lloyd George and the approaches of Lloyd George very soon afterwards. However, um, Joe Lee, a historian, has talked about the truce and um, this uh, and the setting up of matters in Northern Ireland. He sees, in fact, the that partition was a prerequisite for the treaty and Ronan Fanning has suggested that an Ulster settlement was essential to mollify conservatives, bear in mind again we're talking about conservative government, before nationalists could begin. Um, so in a sense um, it was going to be very difficult to undo this. And furthermore, the Northern Prime Minister, James Craig, was very well connected. He had had a number of junior positions in government since late 1916. And in July 1921, he stated to Mark Sturgis, who was in Dublin Castle, he said, I'm going to sit on Ulster like a rock. We're content with what we've got. Let the Prime Minister in Sinn Féin settle this and, if possible, leave us out. And Craig then gained the support of Birkenhead, Chamberlain and other Conservative Unionists. So this was happening on the one hand while de Valera was still insisting on essential unity. However, he did state that unionists should not be coerced, and he did move to a position in the summer of 1921 where he would be prepared to accept um, um, partition with a, a Belfast administration subject to Dublin rather than subject to, um, to London. And the, uh, when this was put to him by Lloyd George, uh, Lloyd George absolutely um, refused it. But nonetheless, there was a kind of an inducement at the time in that um, Lloyd George had decided on a boundary commission to adjust the boundaries. So in one sense, if if Craig had been more flexible at the time, and all of this, of course, is counterfactual speculation, but if he had been flexible, he might have thought that he could hold on to all of the six counties if he were prepared to come in under the Dublin government um, or uh, their um, they, let's say be devolved from the Dublin government, whereas if he took the route of um, standing his ground and being subject to the Boundary Commission, then he, he ran the risk of losing some territory. Now, of course, the whole reason why the Boundary Commission was considered acceptable at all to Lloyd or to sorry, Arthur Griffith was the expectation that large chunks of territory for Man and Tyrone, both of which had small um, nationalist majorities, that these, along with um, along with parts of South Down, South Armagh, Derry City, perhaps these would all be transferred. And then the assumption was that economic forces would lead the northern state to collapse. And this is a very um, implausible theory. It was encouraged. This understanding was encouraged by Lloyd George. Um, but really, the um, of course, size isn't crucial to the viability of any state. And in fact, if they had taken that route and if these transfers were made, um, then 
the northern state would be much more stable and indeed more prosperous as well, because the poor areas would be ditched in the, in the course of all of this. So the negotiations um, proceeded and ultimately the decision taken in the final version of the treaty was that there would be a boundary commission. Um, one of the other features of the treaty was a clause in preventing any legislation that would um, introduce discrimination on the grounds of religion. And such an article had actually been in all the previous Home Rule bills also. And uh, we find it in the Government of Ireland Act. And we find it also in the treaty, almost the same um, one. And it, the whole point initially of having uh, a clause, an article in Home Rule legislation that would block religious discrimination. The, the purpose of this was to protect the Protestant minority, but it, under the Government of Ireland Act, one would have thought it might have protected the Catholic minority, but that wasn't to be the case. The whole idea of a boundary commission was seen quite plausible at this point because many boundaries were being redrawn in Europe following the First World War anyway, and many in many cases plebiscites were to be introduced. And when the possibility of a boundary commission was initially presented to Lloyd George, it was on the understanding that the boundaries would be redrawn in connection with the wishes of the inhabitants, but that was not to, to happen in the end. Um, I, ironically, perhaps it was Craig initially who had come up with the idea of a boundary commission back in 1919, when the British government was considering whether it was going to exclude nine or six counties. But by the time of the treaty negotiations, Craig was very much opposed to it. So ultimately, um, the treaty was signed with this provision for a boundary commission, um, but things were to go horribly wrong following all of this. The treaty, when it was when it came before the Doyle, um, the, the debates were quite interesting in terms of the lack or the relatively small amount of attention given to the northern issue. And because the crown and unity were the key themes, the two key themes throughout the summer of 1921, it seems all the more surprising that during the debates this wasn't to be the case. However, there was some grave concern expressed by a, a few people. And one of these was Sean McEntee. Now, one of the reasons for extreme concern um, for the, the, the plight of Northern Catholics at the time was that in 1920, um, trouble had broken out in the Northeast, initially in Derry, and in July 1920, uh, shipyard expulsions had occurred and Catholics were driven out from many of uh, from their homes. Um, Protestants who were associated with the labour interests were also driven out because they were considered as crypto-nationalists. And uh, it, it, what, what followed was essentially a combination of the traditional sectarianism that had been frequently seen in the 19th century and had been the subject in some cases of investigations of official reports in the 19th century, it was a combination of that type of um, uh, violence that would some, often target people for their religion or target orange halls or Catholic property. But in this case, in 1920, it also took on elements of the War of Independence um, which included tit-for-tat killings involving policemen and the IRA. And uh, 13 people were killed in Belfast the day before the truce and further killings follow, followed despite the truce. Um, at one point, the Bishop of uh, Down and Connor, Joseph McRory, talked about uh, about 144 houses coming under attack in a fairly small area. These were Catholic houses. So as the violence progressed, um, Obviously, there was a state of panic in the north and Sean McAtee, who pointed out in the Doyle that he had been born in Belfast and lived most of his life there, he argued that those sitting for Ulster constituencies had betrayed their, cons um, their constituents. So let's just consider who were the people involved. So if we go back to the 1921, um, let's see, election. Um, these elections took place following the Government of Ireland Act and Sinn Féin, in most cases, Sinn Féin um, members won, but in the North, the situation was somewhat different. So here we see that my, a number of figures here stood for more than one constituency. So essentially in the 1921 election, um, the elections in the North were for the Northern Parliament and the elections in the South uh, were obviously for the Government of Ireland Parliament, which nobody wanted at that point. Um, but we see here that Michael Collins was the candidate for Armagh. Now, he also stood for a, a Cork constituency. 
and he was elected in, in both cases. And Owen McNeil was in Derry City and he also stood for the NUI, Eamon de Valera, and represented both Down and Clare. Arthur Griffiths, we see again having two constituencies and Sean Milroy also had two constituencies. So here we have a number of people who actually know hardly anything about the North. Owen McNeil was from the North, but he had been living in the South for decades at this point. But the others really had no personal experience of it. The one person or the person who had most experience was Sean McAtee, who stood for a different constituency. And he was gravely concerned. He said that those sitting for the Ulster constituencies had betrayed their constituents who had endured conditions that their representation representatives had no conception of, but nonetheless they stood by Sinn Féin. He described the treaty as the most dangerous and diabolical onslaught that has ever been made upon the unity of our nation. And he argued that it made union impossible to obtain. He saw the removal of nationalists from the North as weakening the chances of bringing Northern Ireland into the Republic. And he believed that the, the North would be flooded with soldiers from the South. He said England, or sorry, Ulster will become England's fortress in Ireland and predicted that so long as Ulster is in the, posi the position you are going to place her in, um, this instrument will not budge one inch. And he also foresaw the reinforcement of cultural demarcation between um, nationalists and unionists. So McEntee wasn't alone in his concern about arms flooding Ulster. This point was raised by others as well, by Brian Cusack, for example, by Margaret Pierce, and Owen McNeil feared civil war with the North because he said that the entire Orange population was armed to the teeth, somewhat um, exaggerated, but nonetheless um, partly true. And indeed, um, the auxiliaries had uh, gained more support shortly before from the British government, uh, shortly before the treaty was signed. So McNeil, a northerner, was keenly aware of the vulnerability of northern Catholics. However, various other figures um, who, who wanted to see unity nonetheless um, sought to promote the treaty for other reasons. So, for example, Owen McNeil, oh, sorry, Owen O'Duffy, who was in Monaghan, believed that the businessmen favoured unity, but the orange assassins did, did not. So that this was part of a concern and indeed a boycott of Belfast goods in the previous years had been geared towards trying to persuade um, Northern Protestants that they would lose out economically if they didn't cooperate with the South. Um, on the opening uh, day of the debates, de Valera stated categorically that the fight was with Britain and not with Ulster. And he hoped for some kind of statement at the beginning that um, they did not recognise the right of any part of Ireland to secede. And indeed, when he um, he had repeatedly, of course, during the summer of 1921, talked about the essential unity. Sean Milroy, who was to play a very important role in border issues later in the Boundary Commission, he spoke at length and he noted unrealistic expectations in light of de Valera's previous statement that Ulster could not be coerced. And Milroy believed that economic compulsion or if economic isolation would compel Ulster to reconnect with the rest of the country. This is something Lloyd George had suggested also. And Milroy said, reject this treaty, you bring confusion and chaos throughout the whole of Ireland and the sign to the bigots of Ulster to start the renewed vigour pogroms on the helpless minority because these attacks on the Catholics in the North had been described as a pogrom. Ernest Blythe, who was a Northern Protestant himself, was also a Republican. He argued that the possibility of an absolutely united Ireland was abandoned when de Valera had sent a certain letter indicating he would not use coercion. So again, here there are some people who knew all along that a Republic was not likely to be achieved. Now, ultimately, um, the, the, we know that the treaty, of course, went to a vote. And the result was 64 to 57. Um, and on the 16th, as we are all aware, if we've been following the news, of course, the 16th of January, um, power or the, the Dublin Castle was handed over to a new provisional government. Um, shortly after that, um, Craig and Collins met in London. This meeting was convened by Churchill, but it was requested by, um, by Craig. And Craig, uh, an agreement was reached there to alter the Boundary Commission arrangements, eliminating the chairman. Um, and this uh, was a case of Irishmen being able to deal with their own issue, excluding Britain. However, so at a subsequent meeting, it became clear that their expectations were radically different, that um, Michael Collins 
uh, expected radical changes in the Boundary Commission and Craig had different ideas. Um, ultimately, the Boundary Commission was very late in getting underway and one of the key reasons for this really was the civil war, the outbreak of civil war that um, drew a lot of attention away from the North. Meanwhile, Collins had adopted this rather unusual combination, combined policy of um, coercion and uh, gestures of reconciliation in early 1922. On the one hand, he was um, supporting IRA activity in the North. Um, ostensibly to protect Catholics who were coming under attack, but in fact the increased IRA presence made matters worse. Um, so on the one hand we have Collins engaging in that kind of activity, on the other hand we have him engaging also in peace negotiations, not only the January one that broke down, but also another one in March that broke down also. So we have quite an incoherent policy on the part of Collins, but what is interesting is that he had various other ventures like setting up a Northern Advisory Committee as well for information on Ulster. And when I think back of, of my own experiences growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, um, the, the common view held at that point was De Valera was the one who had um, been against partition and Collins had sold out. But if we look closely at the situation, we find that Collins was in fact deeply concerned about what was happening in the North and had come up with a number of strategies, but they were quite incoherent and not very successful. But in terms of it being a priority for him, it undoubtedly was. Um, so the Boundary Commission was delayed because of the Civil War. It was also delayed because Craig didn't want anything to do with it. It didn't get underway until 1924. And as we probably all know, um, ultimately it collapsed when uh, the findings of the Commission were leaked uh, and it emerged that um, only minor rectifications were going to happen. Now, it's interesting that McNeil at that time was in disgrace for not having come up with a better deal and the government was, um, let's say, Cosgrave was generous as the leader of the government at the time in realising the difficulty facing the, and, and the challenge facing McNeil, but nonetheless, many of his um, followers were rather shocked that he had allowed such a um, uh, a debate and a, a, such a, a, a report, um, let's say McNeil ultimately resigned before the report was totally finished, but nonetheless, he had been party to these negotiations. Nevertheless, McNeil's own comment afterwards was that the government had had a narrow escape and they didn't seem to realise it. And in essence, McNeil shared here the view already um, expressed by Sean McEntee, that if the boundary was made more satisfactory, then it would be more enduring. That appears to be what behind, was behind um, McNeil's view that the government had a narrow escape. Now, while all of this is quite disastrous, and we know that civil war, of course, had broken out um, in June 1922 and continued up to April 1923. And during the civil war, a lot of the arguments regarding the treaty resurfaced. And we have comments, for example, being made um, about, about the fanaticism of Republicans, um, a great bitterness about their obsession with um, matters, with, with formula, as the rigs um, criticised in some respects, um, and uh, really savage references to uh, um, the kind of savagery that came out in the treaty debates uh, resurfaced very much in relation to executions as people like uh, Kevin O'Higgins and Owen McNeil sought to justify the, execu the executions and to believe uh, and to argue essentially that the Republicans were killing the nation. And um, these arguments were presented in very strong form. So all of this seems very uh, unsuccessful and very unsatisfactory. And of course, we know that the divisions that occurred and continued to the point that it was only in a very recent times that Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael could actually um, sit in a coalition government. But there were elements as well of achievements that are worth mentioning, and this refers to international relations. So let's consider what the issue here was. Robert Emmett had famously said in the speech from the dock in 1803, when my country takes her place among the nations of the earth then, and not till then, let my epitaph be written. And this was recalled later um, when Ireland joined the League of Nations. Uh, when, if we were to look at the situation, um, look in terms of the achievements of the, uh, the treaty, uh, we would have to acknowledge that these are way uh, more significant than anything on offer under the Government of Ireland Act earlier. Uh, 
and the treaty allowed the Irish Free State to develop international relations. The revolutionary generation's imaginary, imagined role for Ireland in international affairs has been uh, explored by a few scholars, a number of scholars, including Gerard Keown, who's produced this book here, First of Small Nations. And this relates here to the identification or the, the sense of Ireland having a role with other small um, nations in international affairs. And some of this has been examined also by one of our my own um, former students, Lily Zach, who looked at this identification with um, small states in Europe, successor states of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm initially about being able to join the League of Nations and the treaty was uh, registered with the League of Nations, but it soon became clear that promoting inter international relations was rather more difficult. For one thing, it was very expensive. And um, after the accession of Ireland to the League of Nations and after delegation, and, um, including Cosgrave, as president of the Executive Council, after they came back and reflected on it, people uh, were very much aware of the cost, the enormous cost of international relations, even of, um, of entertaining um, visiting dignitaries in Ireland. And later on, Joseph Walsh, as um, uh, the key figure in the Department, as civil servant, a uh, key figure in the Department of External Affairs was known for his stinginess, but the government really didn't have very much money for this. Another factor was that once they actually began to see how the League of Nations operated, they became aware that the big power still had considerable influence over certain blocs. Um, nevertheless, as de Valera came to power in, as president of the League of Nations, um, a, this added undoubtedly to the, the Irish prestige, even if he argued very strongly in his presidential address that small nations, whilst being given a voice, have little real influence in the determination of the League's action. And just one last element then in relation to Ireland taking her place among the nations in a rather different way, and this is um, Ireland's involvement with imperial conferences uh, in the context of Ireland's membership um, of the British Commonwealth. And the first imperial conference our, that Irish delegates attended was just after the uh, accession to the League of Nations. It was October 1923. Um, and a Department of External Affairs memorandum noted, I quote, an ever increasing insistence on their status as independent nations within the empire. And in that forum, in, in the forum of um, the Commonwealth of Common, uh, attending the common imperial conferences in 1926 again, and later, um, Ireland pressed for increased dominion autonomy, which ultimately um, did occur in the form of the Statute of Westminster in 1931, which greatly facilitated radical changes subsequently. So looking back over all of this period, it's undoubtedly the case that um, one could say that the opportunities that Michael Collins had referred to follow at the time of the treaty um, did become real and the ultimate pragmatic just in all of this has to be de Valera, who ultimately signed the Oath of Allegiance, despite all his reservations, entered the Doyle, came to power and dismantled the treaty. But this was only possible because of what had been done previously. Um, and in 1937, he replaced the 1922 constitution with his own Bonrach na Heron, Article 2 of which stated that the national territory consists of the whole of Ireland, uh, of Ireland, its islands and territorial seas. So in a sense, he did... Um, prove Collins's point at that time, even though he um, the animosity still remained for a very long time. So we're back to the question then as to whether it was a mistake to sign the treaty. I would certainly say it was a mistake to sign it at 2.15 a.m. on the 6th of December. The instructions given to the plenipotentiaries had clearly indicated that they should submit the complete document and wait. They had no reason to think de Valera might have changed his mind at that point. In effect, they seem to have been just worn down and accounts of their itineraries would explain why this was. Lloyd George had been very theatrical, waving papers and insisting that a verdict be sent to Craig by a particular time. Sorry. Um, and and it, the, perhaps the most interesting response to all of this was Mary McSweeney in the Doyle saying, uh, and being so skeptical of the whole question of um, sending the message to Craig. She said, really, Sir James Craig waiting for an answer and a gunboat waiting to be put out is the reason why our fight for 750 years is to be lost at the last minute. Who is James Craig, I ask you? And that he could not wait uh, on the will and the time of the Irish Republic. 
what right has Ulster, Belfast, as we call it, to dictate as to whether our plenipotentiaries shall or shall not sign a document at any particular hour? So these points were, I think, well, um, I think they very well summed up the situation and the sense of indignation of certain other figures. But undoubtedly, the bitterness um, in, in that resulted from the treaty continued if we were to ask ourselves if there was any alternative at the time. Well, if the treaty uh, had been brought back to Ireland, then de Valera had argued later, if the planet potentries had returned with it, they might have been able to come to some form of agreement. If whether that agreement would have worked or not is debatable. It probably, if any improvement on the treaty probably wouldn't, if we were to consider how um, stringent the British government was in relation to redrafting the 1922 constitution. If we were to engage in what ifs, um, we could note that there were various attempts um, and ideas in Collins's mind as to how to involve um, some of his opponents in the early months of 1922, for example, his idea of involving external uh, ministers, uh, some of whom could be from, um, from the other side. Uh, that would have been a possibility as well. But perhaps uh, while we could blame the treaty as, and see that as the main factor, there was another crucial factor as well that probably uh, ultimately was the most damaging. And that was the decision um, of the British government to put pressure on the Irish um, government, on the provision government, to bombard the four courts in, 19, in June 1922. At the time, the capitalist role of this was the assassination of Henry Wilson, who had been military advisor to the Northern government. And the assumption was that the uh, initiative had come from the anti-treatyites who had taken up um, position in the four courts in April. Um, later on, Owen McNeil did ask or did consider that perhaps it would have been better to just let them there. But whether that would have been possible or not um, is debatable. But nonetheless, the fact that the provisional government used guns, British guns, to uh, oust the rebels from the four courts uh, seemed to be the last straw. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, <clears throat> for a very uh, clear and a succinct account, which uh, ranged over the background to the negotiations uh, of and the reception of uh, the treaty. Um, I can't, um, circumstances uh, prevent me from asking for a round of applause, but I, I suppose the 115 of you that are out there and that have been stayed with us uh, through all, uh, th through the lecture, uh, will um, will will um, applaud uh, at home. Now, uh, I hope Mary's um, going to uh, stay to um, yes. field a few questions, as it were. Um, we have a, a number of questions which are in already, so maybe we might uh, devote ten minutes or so to questions, if that's all right with Mary. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can, uh, there's a number of questions here already and, uh, and, and some comments. Uh, you can keep them coming on in the Q&A box, uh, which um, uh, should be there on your screen. So I'll ask the questions in the order in which they were, uh, they came to us. Uh, the first one uh, came from Liam Shortall. Um, it seems quite yep. obvious, says Liam, that a 32 country republic would not be delivered by the treaty negotiations. But do you think the delegates should have held out for a completely independent 26 counties, considering the partition, partition was put in place before the truce? Yeah. Um, now, it does seem obvious that a 32 county republic wasn't going to materialize. But there were still a lot of people who hoped that it might somehow do so. And I think if we go back to the, the line of thought of some of the people involved in the rising, it seems that they believed that if they tried hard enough, were true enough to the cause and were prepared to make the ultimate, um, the ultimate sacrifice, that somehow they were going to be rewarded. Um, but that, of course, in the practicalities, that couldn't really happen. So 
uh, some people got that. I think Griffith certainly and Collins realized it. And Griffith and Collins were also very much aware that this was an evolving situation. And, and they were aware that the Commonwealth was evolving and that the situation was that this would raise possibilities for the future. But a lot of others uh, just felt committed to what they had committed to in the past and felt it would be abhorrent to actually deviate from this. But it's almost as if there are two different lines of thought. And now I know people like uh, people have pointed out that the kind of um, black and white images of the two sides are too stark. And Dermot Ferreter in his um, most recent book on this has talked about the needs to explore alternatives as well, or, and the shades of grey as well as the black and white. But nevertheless, there was an element almost of magical thinking, I think, on the part of some of the Republicans. And it, one would have to ask, like, what did they expect was going to happen? Um, but as regards whether or not the 26 counties could have got complete independence, um, I think they probably wouldn't. I think the government was too uh, obsessed with maintaining the uh, Ireland within the empire. And um, it, Jolie somewhere has referred to um, the metaphysical mo uh, monarchy. And this is because we talk about metaphysical Republicans as people who are wedded to the concept. Um, but I think in, with the metaphysical monarchy, he's pointed out that the British were also absolutely obsessed with the idea of their symbols. So I don't think they were prepared to let that go at that time. You know, I think it's an interesting question, certainly. Um, but it is, it was almost impossible. They had been, I mean, Griffith was quite right in saying that, um, it, you know, that the Republic couldn't have been delivered. But the, the 32 count, either the 32 county Republic, but the other Republic couldn't either. So I know the Republicans have taken a lot of flack for being intransigent in that. But on the other side, there was a lot of intransigence too. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Um, there's a comment here from Chris Barry, essentially um, complimenting you for a superb, superb discussion of such a complex issue. So that's from Chris Barry. Mm -hmm. um, if we can move on to uh, Timothy Hoyt. Um, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, despite its support for violent republicanism, had in the past been willing to take pragmatic steps towards an eventual republic, yeah. including the new departure and cooperation with constitutional nationalists. How much did this tradition, in addition to Michael Collins's leadership of the IRB, contribute to validating the stepping stone argument during the dull discussions? Well, I'm not sure if they were aware of it as a tradition or whether they were, uh, Collins just shared their mindset, not necessarily because he wanted to be true to anything the IRB had done in the past, but undoubtedly Collins's leadership was very important to, um, to winning support for the treaty. And, um, and the comparison has occurred to me before. In fact, I think at another version of that, other notes I had for this lecture where I was going to mention as well the, the fact that the IRB had uh, adopted other strategies. The real, uh, I think, in from 1912 onwards or 1913 onwards, the Republicans become more single-minded. A lot of them become more single-minded in what they need to achieve and how they're going to achieve it. But there is undoubtedly the case that they had been uh, worked in different ways in the past and they had worked through the GAA and been involved in um, Irish language organisations and that uh, generally with the ultimate goal being in mind. But it is the case, certainly, that this flexibility was there. And, and it is, I would see as well, the similarity between Collins and the new departure. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Uh, moving on to Brendan Fennerty. Um, Brendan was attended a, a recent exhibition yeah. on the treaty in London. Uh, where it was suggested that the British personnel were of, uh, had, had far more experience uh, than the Irish delegation. But Brenda's question is really how was de Valera's decision not to attend viewed by the general public in Ireland at that time, or is it possible to um, answer that question? Um, I'm not sure how they viewed it, but certainly they were very um, critical of it afterwards. So I think it was something of a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, Paul Campbell is here. Um, Paul Campbell refers back to his uh, time in the CBS uh, secondary school in Roscommon where the treaty was debated. Um, he, he, yeah, uh, the anti-treaty side easily won the debate uh, and he was uh, on the, um, on the uh, losing side. But the question is, was there greater support among the old, older Dáil members for the treaty in 1922? Um, or is it possible to, uh, uh, to, to answer that? Um, I haven't actually thought of that. I think it would be very interesting to look at it. Because we know that, it, it, I mean, go, rolling back a few years, that there was definitely a generational gap between the ongoing support for the home rule uh, when a lot of the younger generation were moving towards advanced nationalism. But as regards the treaty, well, I actually haven't thought of that, but it's a very good question. Somebody should have a look at that. Yeah, the answer might be fine, found in Liam Weeks's and, uh, uh, and O'Farty's book. Um, on the treaty, the collection of essays, I yeah. think uh, that there's profiles there of the uh, of the people uh, who uh, of the of those who voted on the treaty. Yeah. Um, Sean Burke, uh, when were the terms of the Boundary Commission drafted, and was the Dáil unaware of the contradiction between the wishes of the inhabitants and the economic geographical position of the area? So. Okay, so it was, yeah, the decision, um, it emerged during the summer, I, I mentioned initially that James Craig had come up with it in 1919 and then afterwards wanted nothing to do with it. So then when uh, Lloyd George presented it initially, it was, he mentioned only the wishes of the inhabitants, but then the final version had the references to economic and geographical position. And one of the issues that had emerged, of course, was that there were areas like um, the Glens of Antrim where there were Catholic enclaves and it would be rather difficult to deal with that. And in, um, so as regards the Doyle being unaware of the contradiction, it really depended. I, I mean, the Doyle at that stage wouldn't maybe have known um, what emphasis was going to be put. So the, the clause itself, didn't give enough information really on which was the priority and the, the I mean the treaty negotiators were entitled really it wasn't surprising if they assumed it was going to be the wishes of the inhabitants because that had been so important in the continental European boundaries being redrawn so in that sense it was all it was to be expected but the way in which it was interpreted later then um was another matter and it was very, the, the discrepancy became obvious at a very early stage at the meeting between um the, the second meeting between Collins and Craig which occurred at the beginning of February that's when it, it emerged that they separately they as individuals had different perceptions of what was involved okay uh, thanks Mary I think we're overshooting our uh, 10 minutes I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of the uh, questions. Um, I don't know, Mary, uh, you can see them there, can you? Um, I'm looking at them now, yes. Do you want to select one or two that you might? Surely de Valera and his cohorts did not believe in democracy. Well, that's an interesting one, all right, of course. The majority have no right to do wrong. Um, okay, the, John, Sean Gibbons said that's, I think you're correct. This may have, he may have realised that it, it would be very difficult to actually produce. And he himself, of course, um, had failed over the summer. So that's not surprising. Okay. So, yeah, there are the questions here about the pressure of Lloyd George and the media war, of course, like that was a, a crucial factor in all of this. And the, the um, anti-treatyites could say with great justification later on that, um, that the decision taken on the Doyle wasn't really a democratic one because it was under duress. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, we've probably we've gone on for uh, 20 minutes of questions now, Mary, so maybe we might okay. leave it at that. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, congratulations coming in, I see, from uh, Michael Kane and from uh, Patrick uh, McMenamin uh, from Bride uh, Brady. Yeah, 
Um, Thank so, you. yeah. So, uh, will we leave? I think we should leave it at that. Um, the um, uh, unfortunately, we weren't yeah. able to get to the later questions, uh, but um, uh, I think we've had an informative uh, evening. And thanks again uh, to Mary uh, for the um, uh, for, for for her uh, for her address and her insights. And um, um, we'll uh, adjourn as as it were. Um, uh, good night, everybody. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you all for coming.